we simply cannot allow people to pour into the United States undetected, undocumented, unchecked. And complete the dang fence. This bill that we will sign today is not a revolutionary bill. Cast down your bucket where you are. We come from France. And I am, you know, adamantly against illegal immigrants. They're coming in by the thousands, just unbelievable. A Deal. wall is an immorality. Who are you rooting for? Those masters of the universe are at it again. You maniac! You blew it up! Welcome to Parsing Immigration Policy, the podcast of the Center for Immigration Studies. My name is Mark Bercorian, Executive Director of the Center, and we're going to talk today about a report that we published that kind of got a lot of publicity. President Trump referred to it, Elon Musk referred to it, and it got a lot of uh, mileage, and there was a lot of pushback from supposed fact-checking organizations. So I thought I'd have on the actual author, Todd Benzman, National Security Fellow here at the Center, to talk about it. Hello, Todd. And we're going to have links in the show notes to the various things that we've published on this. But the point of it is you wrote about a program that authorizes people who have no right to come to the United States. The administration just gives them authorization to come here and then paroles them in. And we filed a Freedom of Information Act request to get some more information on this that wasn't being released. And so if you could kind of tell us what the uh, basic story is, and then we'll take it from there. Sure. Well, thanks for having me on. This piece and the topic that that it addresses is actually not new. We have been reporting on this since uh, September of 2023 that the administration had stood up a program to fly hundreds of thousands of inadmissible aliens directly from foreign airports into U.S. airports. They announced this in January of 2023 and then just kind of blew it off after that. And we never heard anything more about it. You know, well, are they flying people in and where are they flying people in? And it was a seemed like a natural question after that. So I asked and got no response and filed a FOIA, Freedom of Information Act request, no response there either. So finally, we we just filed a suit on that and then started getting dribs and drabs of information out of them. The total numbers broken down by nationalities. There are nine nationalities. We put all of that out mm-hmm. in a very significant, meaty report in September. It got a little bit of attention, but I guess because we weren't in silly season, you know, with a I don't know, a presidential election campaign where immigration is an apex issue, all the polls show. Uh, so when we did a an update on it, which was that the administration's lawyers finally told us why they won't give us the airport locations. Right. The answer being, well, We've flown so many people into some of these airports that it's created a security vulnerability, and we don't want to let the bad guys know where it might be. So we're not going to give the airports to you. And so I wrote that up, and I guess because Elon Musk uh, spotted it and you know tweeted it out, uh, you know, or X'd it out, it sort of caught a lot more error than the first report in twenty. 23. But a lot of the interest was in just the fact that they were flying them in, right. not so much that airport security had been compromised at some level, or they seemed to be claiming that airport security. I thought the bigger story was that airport security was compromised, but right. whatever, everybody's taking their piece uh, that, that interests them out of it. Right. So just a short version of what was in our update report from last week. In other words, how many people and what were the countries they're from? And then we'll get to maybe some of the misunderstandings that people had of the report. Sure. Well, we have data, updated data from October 22. Our first report had it through about mid-September or a few days into September. And then we had updated data through to the end of December as part of our lawsuit. 
So that all ended up to be about 320,000 and change immigrants flown in. Most of them are from the four countries, Cuba, Nicaragua, Haiti, and Venezuela. But in the year since they did, they announced the program, they expanded that flights program to Guatemalans, Salvadorans, Hondurans, Colombians, and then also Ecuadorans. Right. So there are now nine countries whose citizens are able to, from maybe their homes or from some third other country, could have a relative in the U.S. apply for this on their behalf. And then they put all the inputs into CBP-1 on a phone app, computer interface with the U.S. government. And if they get authorized to fly, then they fly right into as far as we can tell from the data, somewhere between 35 at, at the on the bottom end airports and up to 43, somewhere in that neighborhood. Before we talk about the airports, the point here is that even though this is sold as a family reunification program, the rationale people have given is, well, these people are already on a waiting list to get a green card, and this will just enable them not to have to wait abroad for their number to come up, basically, because they're in line. Um, And there's two problems with that. One is the reason we have numerical limits is to not let in more people than we want. And so they're supposed to wait in line rather than just be let in and then, you know, convert to a green card whenever they get around to it. But the other problem is that the way these programs work is you have to have a sponsor. The sponsor does not have to be a relative. You don't have to be on a waiting list for family immigration. You can just find a sponsor of, uh, it could be a business. In fact, this is what the website says. It could be a business, a nonprofit group, somebody who use pledges to cover your costs, whether anybody enforces that or not is a separate question. So this is you know, a potential for more than just a handful of relatives that legal immigrants already here have. Right. Uh, Well said. And, you know, there are some other public interests involved in having knowledge of this as well. I mean, one of them is that, you know, big cities across the country that are staggering under the weight of unfunded fiscal burdens from having hundreds of thousands of immigrants showing up at their doorstep with hands out that, you know, they're blaming Governor Greg Abbott for the most part. Right. He's, this evil Republican is uh, bussing in a bunch of immigrants from the border just to kind of cause wreak havoc. But it may very well turn out that, you know, significant numbers of them are being authorized for travel by this program into these cities. 320,000 had to have gone somewhere. Right. I can pretty much guarantee you that they are in New York, Chicago, and Miami and everywhere else. And they deserve to know for planning purposes at the very least, or if they want to mount opposition to it to petition their federal government leaders for redress, you have to have knowledge to to be able to go to the government and say, stop doing this. It's killing us. Yeah. And number two is that's just for the arrival airports. But uh, to me, a very significant component of all of this is the departure airports. Right. Where are they flying from? And w- why do we need to know that? What's important about knowing that other than that it would sate some curiosity? It's that if we know where they are flying from, then people like me or reporters or local reporters could actually go to these airports, find the people that are getting on board and and find out who they really are and what they're qualifications are and what whether the program's public claims are actually being carried out on the ground. Are these really people joining families? Are they is this really about, you know, waiting for green cards or, or you know, are they just anybody and anybody who applies? Right. Yeah. And so and again to emphasize our request, our Freedom of Information Act request, they did eventually comply with in, to give us the numbers, but as you're pointing out, they refuse to tell us which airports people are leaving from. And that's not self-evident because even though the people participating in this legally dubious program have to be nationals of those countries listed, they don't have to actually come for there. They could be anywhere 
And so the airports they're coming from matter, and the airports they're going to matter, and neither one of those things will they tell us. And like you said, because it would create vulnerability, security vulnerabilities at these airports. What the, so what that means is this program, again, this is a parole program that is an abuse of the very narrow parole power, that this, the Biden administration's own program, they are admitting is creating a security threat at airports, and yet they're continuing it anyway, and it's still going on now, right? Absolutely. I mean, it looks like they're flying, you know, 30 or 40,000 a month then. Right. That's not including the, the land ports, which is a whole other kind of cousin program. Which we've talked about some, but it is important. You're right. It's important to make that clear that this is a separate thing from people making appointments with that CBP-1 app and then crossing at the land border with Mexico. That's a whole separate thing. Somewhat larger, but still, they're both hundreds of thousands of people. That's right. And if if northern cities are you know, struggling with support, supporting, you know, food, shelter, housing, and everything else for hundreds of thousands of foreign nationals coming in. They don't really care how they came in, whether they were flown in, whether they came in on a CBP-1 invitation, scheduled invitation at the bridges or illegally or ran through and got it. It's the totality of the border crisis. Right. That you can't really talk about the border crisis in totality without also accounting for programs like these that have brought in 750,000 people, probably more. Right. Just in January and February and March. And the, um, the direct flight thing that we've been talking about and that you issued the update on last week that got all the attention, that is, in a sense, part of the border crisis Biden has created, because even though they're not wading across the Rio Grande or, you know, climbing through a hole in the fence in Arizona or something, every international airport is a border. In other words, the border of the United States isn't just on a map. Every international airport is a, represents a border of the United States. And the Biden administration is waving inadmissible aliens. People have no right to be here and letting them in both at the land border you see on a map, but also at all the airport borders, or at least, you know, several dozen of the airport borders. And that's one of the things we're trying to get out of them is which airports and how many people go and where. Right. And I don't think it's getting too far over our skis to presume that, you know, Mayor Adams or, you know, any of those big city mayors out there would absolutely love to know how many are coming to his airport every month. Right. And might have something to say about it. Right, exactly. Instead of just complaining about Greg Abbott buying bus tickets, which right, even right. taking the this direct flight part of the administration's parole scheme out of the picture, even without that, the large majority of people showing up in New York certainly are not people who were bussed by Texas. That's a relatively small That's share. That's true of too. Flow. That's true too. Yeah. So what were some of the ways people misunderstood or misinterpreted the study that got the attention of an AP fact check, CNN, and various others? What were some of the things that people said about the report that were actually not what we had reported? Right. So people who had not been familiar with our reporting back in September and October and beyond about this program you know, suddenly we got vast new audience right. drawn attention to the fact that they were flying people in or that they were authorizing the flights in, I should say. Well, that's an important thing to point out. That's right. But you see how easy it is to slip into that. They're flying right. people in. But that's kind of what happened is that, you know, conservative media outlets kind of, you know, saw this report, saw the Elon Musk tweet and heard Trump talk about it at his victory speech. And they kind of characterized it in a way that seemed to suggest that the government was paying for for these flights, right? That they were picking up the tab. Uh, that was number one, and then you know that. And of well, course let's has- let's clear that up before we get to others. So the way this works is they get authorization to fly. It's kind of a fake visa, basically, that Homeland Security has no legal authority to give. 
supposed to be the State Department, but they're just sort of essentially giving kind of made up visas. And then, then they have to buy their own plane ticket or somebody buys it for them. But the government, it's not like chartered flights where the government is rounding up illegal aliens and flying them here, which is kind of what I think some people imagined this was turning into. Yeah, big taxpayer boondoggle kind of thing. Right. But it's not that. They are expected, once they're approved and authorized by CBP for travel, they are responsible for arranging their own commercial flights. Now, I don't know if NGOs or, you know, nonprofits uh, or, you know, charities are kind of giving them money for that. I don't really know about that. That's one of the things that would be great about knowing the departure airports because we could go there and meet them and talk to them and interview them. But we'll never know uh, until we have that information or somebody does. So the other kind of significant, I guess, wrong uh, that was kind of repeated out there was that the program was completely secret. It was a big secret government program that was suddenly exposed. Right. And, you know, that's sort of a a little bit parsing definitions. I've never personally called it a secret program because they announced it. It was announced. There were documents published about it and they had press conferences in the beginning, but then they just sort of left it alone and hoped everybody forgot about it because it is a sight unseen. It's an invisible program. I guess they knew as long as they didn't, they didn't provide regular, uh, very clearly identified data and numbers on it that were clearly identified as a flight-based program that everybody would just kind of blow it off. They wouldn't know about it. And that is exactly what happened. I think the broad public had no clue that this was happening. It's fair to call it their approach to the secretive, but it's not like it was an actual classified CIA secret that they weren't telling you about. Right. This isn't like the uh, post 9-11 rendition program or waterboarding or some kind of CIA thing. You know, that's what, what I think of when I think of a secret government program. Right. But they were most certainly opaque about every aspect of it. That's why we had to file a FOIA. Right. We asked for a reasonable request. We put reasonable requests in for, you know, how many are you flying in and what nationalities and where Mm -hmm. and got no answer. And that is secretive at the very least. Sure. Not transparent. Definitely you know, kind of covering the blinds, you know, closing the blinds and not letting anybody see what's really going on. There were fact checkers out there who were like, well, is it really a secret program? No. And if we can show that it wasn't a secret government program, we can cast an aspersion on whether it's even happening at all. The whole narrative must be wrong if this thing is wrong, right? You kind of see that Sure. And so we, we saw the Associated Press. It wasn't just small liberal news organizations or websites. It was the Associated Press, which has real reach. And CNN also did one, and maybe somebody else did. I'm not aware. And that's kind of how they put it, that Donald Trump was wrong because at one point in his Tuesday victory speech, the former president said, They're flying them in, which kind of seems like, well, they're paying for it. Right. Or they're being flown in or something like that. That was just really, you know, very parsy the way they, they, well, he's wrong. He's lying. Orange man lied. Right, right. About that uh, kind of a thing. He had also said to finish with Trump, he said they're coming from parts unknown. And they said, no, no, these are the countries that are eligible. But yes. those two things aren't incompatible because they can, in fact, be coming from anywhere. We don't know where they're coming from. They could easily be flying from, you know, from Mexico, from Cameroon, from anywhere. It's just that they have to be nationals of those countries, not that they have to come directly to the U.S. from those countries. So actually, Trump, you know, who often does exaggerate and make up stuff, he really wasn't making that up. That was actually correct. Yeah. And we know that. Uh, some 7 million Venezuelans have been living outside of their their home country for many, right. many years. And same with the Haitians. Haitians have been living in, you know, 
five or 10 different countries other than Haiti and same with Cubans. Mm -hmm. So it really does matter where they're flying from. And we really can say that they are flying from parts unknown, especially if they're not giving us the names of the, the departure airports. That is the definition of parts unknown. Right, exactly. To get to Elon Musk's tweeting out, I think part of the problem there was not so much Musk, but that it was the Daily Mail, which is a kind of sensationalist tabloid. I mean, you've written for them sometimes. It's not like they're, you know, sort of beyond the pale, but they do they do hyperventilate sometimes. And they reported, doing their own reporting, they typified it, uh, you know, mistakenly. And that, if I'm correct here, is what Musk was going off of when he retweeted their story. Yeah, that's right. And it, it wasn't just Musk it was, or, or the Daily Mail. There were a lot of commentators and pundits and social media influencers who likewise put things out that, you know, on the order of, you know, the government is secretly flying in hundreds of thousands of right. people. I mean, they kind of just got that part wrong, which sort of cast a little bit of shade on our reporting. But we, we of course, never said, said any such thing. Either one of those were very explicit about, you know, the beneficiaries of this thing, you know, having to arrange their own flights. And also that this thing was, it was unveiled in a very public way in January. And I've always linked to their documents and their public statements about it. Right, right. So one of the things, the uh, developments that's happened as a result of it is uh, several members of Congress submitted a letter to CBP demanding the release of the information that we are suing CBP to get. What's the, uh, what's the story with that? There is an outrage about this program. It was not well known. Right. Even though we've reported it a little bit, I don't think anybody else really has. You don't you don't see any reporting or any de media demands for reporting or data or numbers about this. Yeah, and frankly, I mean, before you continue, it's pretty outrageous even if you don't exaggerate or mistakenly characterize it. In other words, even if you just stick to the facts, obviously, it is pretty outrageous and people should be outraged by it. Right. And I'm sure that members of Congress, people who are politicians, are hearing things from their constituents at right about now or you know, right. in the last few days. And, you know, they, they want to respond to that. And so a group of about 23 all Republicans in the House congressmen penned a letter to Troy Miller, the acting CBP commissioner, demanding an immediate end to the program, mm -hmm. but also adding their much more substantial voices than mine, I guess, to the calls for transparency. What airports? Which where, where are the airports? And they have a bunch of other questions as well that they came up with that are right in line with the kind of questions that CIS has been asking about this thing for the last year and trying to battle. And to that, I would just say that, you know, the more the merrier, because the explanation, the official explanation for rejecting the call for information is kind of, I don't know, it just seems, I mean, we, we don't buy it. We, we are going to contest their explanation, which is that, you know, well, we've created airport security vulnerabilities. Yeah, my thinking on that excuse they're giving is that there's two possibilities. One is they're exaggerating. You know, they're using this law enforcement exception to the Freedom of Information Act, basically as cover to protect themselves from releasing politically embarrassing information. The other option is they're telling the truth, and that's even worse, which is to say that the administration is creating unnecessary security threats in the United States by running this, I mean, I'll say it, running this illegal parole program. So neither one of those options is particularly appealing. In other words, either they're lying or they're officers of the court. So I won't say they're lying, but because in our court proceedings, it's their attorneys who are presenting this argument. They're exaggerating for political reasons, or they're telling the truth 
and they really are creating security threats to the United States through running this program. Neither one of those explanations is particularly appealing. Right. I mean, you're either standing in a barrel halfway full of muck <laughs> or one that's all the way full of muck. I guess. Yeah. But either, either one of them, not a good option. But one thing that I, I will point out uh, that's kind of struck me about all of this as we speak now is a lot of the outrage is about the, the flights, that they are flying right. people and you can't see them. It's all incognito. and you can't count them and nobody knows what's happening. And and it's just that kind of thing. And, and that does the, one of the reasons that got such resonated with people is because health and human services is in fact flying secretly in the middle of the night, unaccompanied alien minors to various airports. There was a whole, there's a big report about that. Right. Exactly. Flying into the Westchester, New York airport and stuff. So in a sense, when people saw this, they looked at this story through yes. that lens. And that's yes. one of the reasons I think there were these um, misunderstandings of what the report was about. Right. And those are two completely different circumstances right. and exactly. situations. Um, yeah. Sometimes they get conflated. But I'm surprised at the relative absence of any outrage over the, the government's claim, right. which is that, hey, our airports are less secure because of what we did, and we don't want anybody bad to know about it. And I didn't see a reference to that in the letter from the congressman. I'm hoping that somebody will at least press them on that on that claim. We're going to press them in court, right? Yes. Colin Farnsworth, our FOIA director, is on the case and trying to get them, you know, to uh, sort of pin them down on this. But you're right that the report, the one that got all of this attention, the update, basically, version of the report that we published last week, the headline and the lead was specifically about the security vulnerabilities here, not just that here's this program we've never heard of. We've been, like you said, you've been writing about it for months. Exactly. I mean, I, I'm, I'm a little bit surprised that that wasn't the point of outrage and that those who are fact checking, like where's the Associated Press, right? Not writing about a government, an official government claim. We right. have it in a court record that our airports are less secure. Yep. From what we did, that seems to me like a news story. I I was a news reporter for 23 years, so man, if I was still in that business, I I would I think I would be all over that. Right. Absolutely. Okay. Well, thanks. I thought I thought it was important to sort of lay out what the issues are is you've written on this now a couple of times and we'll have links in the show notes to the original report and then you have a couple of follow-ups on this and um we'll see if uh it you know it gets some more bounce and frankly if we can uh extract from the government the list of airports that people are flying from and flying to We will obviously publish that, and maybe we'll have you back and talk about that. Great. Good to be here, and thanks for uh, helping me uh, explain what happened there. Absolutely. And finally, there was another wrinkle to this issue that Todd and I were talking about, that Nayla Rush on our staff, who covers refugee and refugee-like issues, just posted something, just wrote something that we posted on the website and uh, about this very topic, and that is that these 320,000 people who have flown into the United States and gotten parole under the administration's uh, legally dubious, to put it, uh, you know, the mildest policy, uh, is that these people need sponsors. That's the way the program has been set up, is that somebody has to sponsor them and vouch for them and say they'll cover their costs. The interesting thing, and this is what Nayla wrote about, is that the sponsors don't necessarily need to be American citizens or green card holders. That's kind of the way the administration wants to present it. And it's probably true in a lot of instances where somebody is, you know, trying to get their niece or their, you know, brother into the country faster. They're on some waiting list for a green card, but they don't want to have to wait. So they want to cut in line and come in. It's all wrong and frankly illegal in my opinion, but at least that's sort of understandable. In fact, though, You don't have to be in that situation to sponsor and bring in 
to the United States an inadmissible alien. You can yourself be on parole. Someone maybe who snuck across the border and was released on parole or someone who came in under this program and was released on parole, you can then sponsor someone else to be paroled into the country. People who have temporary protected status, that's TPS, which if you follow immigration at all, you understand is nothing temporary about it, but it's for illegal immigrants who are here when some kind of natural disaster or civil strife happens in their own country. We don't want to deport them. We give them work permits temporarily, so-called. And of course, it's permanent for all practical purposes, but the person is not, does not have permanent legal status. They can sponsor people to come in under this direct flight parole program. People with deferred and forced departure, it's another one of those quasi-legal statuses for illegal aliens. People with DACA, if you uh, recall, the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. It's for illegal immigrants, gives them work permits but they don't have any permanent legal status in the United States, they can sponsor people to come in under this illegal program by the Biden administration to parole in foreigners. So this whole thing that Todd and I were talking about today and that he's written about a number of times and Nayla wrote about, as I said, in this recent blog post, it's kind of like an onion. You peel it away and you get one level of absurdity after another. And all the more reason that This program should be ended as a couple dozen congressmen demanded in a letter sent, I believe this week or late last week, based on Todd's work, demanded an end to this program. The sooner, the better. And ultimately, I think Congress is going to have to step in and limit the ability of this or future presidents to engage in this kind of rogue immigration policy making, where they essentially set up their own immigration policy parallel and outside of the law just because they feel like letting people into the country who have no right to be here. Until next week, this is Mark Krikorian. Thanks for tuning in. Feel free to email us at center at cis.org if you have any gripes or story suggestions, people you think you want interviewed, whatever. And if your podcast platform enables you to rate or review podcasts. We'd very much appreciate it. It definitely helps make the podcast more visible to more people. So until next week, this is Mark Krikorian signing off.